Hi, everyone. Welcome to VIP Vet Talk, where we discuss the issues, but also the solutions for veterans in pain. Today, we have Dr. Carol Hendricks, who's joining us from Healing Arizona Vets and specializing in neurology with a focus and emphasis on veterans as well as first responders with closed concussion syndrome. Welcome to the program. Brain wellness is the cornerstone, a major cornerstone to the healing of our veterans in pain. Hi, Michaela. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate you joining us today. We're going to be covering quite a few things that have to do not only with TBIs, PTSD, um, uh, and brain wellness, but also its association, close association with the practice of neurology and the multidisciplinary, uh, multidisciplinary specialties, which are so essential in the comprehensive and therapeutic treatment of it. So we're gonna start with a little bit of a presentation and we really appreciate you putting this together for us today, Dr. Hendricks. So if you'd like to begin, welcome to the program again. So let's get started. Okay, so next slide, please. So I want everyone to look at this video and see what I see. So when there's an impact, whether it's, it's a concussive wave from a blast or from any other kind of impact, the important thing is the way that the brain shakes around inside of the skull. When you're looking at this playing over and over again, you see that the, the frontal lobe of the brain hits up against the inside of the skull in the front and the back of the brain, the occipital cortex, which processes visual information, hits up against the inside of the skull in the back. And when you see the brain shake around inside the skull like that, understand that there's a lot of small tears or shears, shear injury happening throughout the brain. And with the shear injury, you have the disconnection of the, of the axon from the neuron it's connecting with you have disruption of the biochemical environment around the nerve. You have, have the tearing of small blood vessels all throughout the brain. You have destruction of the blood-brain barrier. There, there's many different aspects of injury that happen when you experience this concussive force. You also damage the microstructural cytoskeleton of the neuron itself so so the neuron itself can be deformed so yeah i think there's this big mis misnomer and I, I just to backtrack for for one second so many believe that it, you have to have a concussive uh, traumatic event an injury uh, or actually something hitting the skull in order to have a concussion or a TBI. I'm so grateful that you touch on that, that the high decibel impact as well against the skull can cause just as much of a traumatic brain injury if nothing physically touches the skull, uh, but the high decibel impacts are a huge part of, of this issue as well. Right, you, you don't have to strike your head against anything to have a concussion, just the blast force. You also don't have to lose consciousness in order to have had a concussion. For many years, this was the military's criteria that you had to lose consciousness for at least an hour to have experienced a concussion. And that's just not true. The other important part about a concussion is that it is a cumulative injury. So where you end up post-concussion depends on how many injuries you've experienced throughout your life. So, so many people might have played a rough sport, um, then gone into the military, been in a car accident, hit by an IED. All of these things contribute to the health of the brain. If we think about anybody entering the military, especially army, Marines, you go through boot camp, and with this, you have a highly randomized, highly concussive sounds over time, right? From uh, weaponry, gunfire, explosions, jumping out of airplanes, wind impact, uh, high decibel impact, those types of things. And that's for years. Absolutely, absolutely true. Um, let's go to the next slide. There is not a single veteran that I have treated in my clinic who does not have toxic exposure. And of course, toxic exposure 
includes the thick black smoke and all the smoke from the burn pits. And most of the veterans were exposed to burn pits 24 seven. Oh, burn pit is extremely common as well with uh, the applicants that come to our program and many are unaware that uh, of the toxic exposure that they, you know, get from, from the burn pits. These are often, uh, they could be anything from a smaller pit or can in the middle of a campsite um, where waste is burned and trash to dozens of acres in size where it's not only just waste that's burned there. And from what we understand, it can be anything from, from human waste to gasoline, toxic chemicals, nuclear waste to body parts and rabid dogs. When you're breathing it in and exhaling it, there's another part of the body that's called the skin <laughs> epidermis, which is the largest organ in the body, which also respires. So uh, not only are they breathing it in, but they are absorbing it as well. And uh, I'd love to know more about this br uh, blood brain barrier and how that can also affect the brain due to toxic exposure. Yes. I mean, when you, when you um, cross that blood brain barrier, a lot of toxins get into the brain that normally would not get right. in because the blood brain barrier when it's intact, prevents that from happening. We, we know how dangerous the toxins are from the burn pits because there's an awareness among firemen in the United States that the outer clothing can be quite toxic. So when they come from a fire, they, leave, they now leave their clothing outside the building and hose it down before they bring it in the building because they don't want to breathe have any exposure to those toxins from everything that burned. But this is I'm very similar to 9-11. Um, I think that the conversation that we're having here in regard to toxic exposure for our veterans very much parallels and the need that our first responders absolutely a absolutely all the toxins that they breathe in it gets into your lungs, it touches your skin, it gets into your GI tract and the, all that toxic exposure can lead to many, many other kinds of illnesses, including cancer. And we know that firemen have, firemen with toxic exposure have great, greatly increased incidence of unusual kinds of cancer. So that's another important reason why we need to know what kind of toxins you've been exposed to, what's still in your body and make sure that you get detoxed. When you think about concussion injury or post-concussion syndrome, I talk about five pillars of concussion. Number one is problems with visual focus. In other words, it's hard for you to read for a long time. If you have to look at a computer or work on a computer, you have to keep looking away, get up and take breaks. People with worse problems may even find it hard to read across a line of print or see that letters in a word are reversed or something like that. Um, it's hard to drive at night because there, there's a lot more halos around, around the oncoming headlights and there's a lot more blurring. Number two is memory problems, problems with attention, concentration and memory. You forget what you're talking about mid-sentence you forget people's names, familiar things. You have trouble remembering a conversation that took place earlier in the day. Pillar number three is sleep and sleep disturbance. This includes trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, and early morning, early morning awakening without being able to return to sleep. And a lot of our veterans do have nightmares and night terrors. Number four is balance. And balance problems doesn't mean that you can't walk straight. It's the sense of feeling dizzy or lightheaded or woozy episodically and maybe trouble when you're changing positions like going from sitting to standing, you feel a little off balance or when you change positions, you feel like you have to hold on to something or you might fall. And the last but most important one is emotions and emotional instability. You have 
the two most common symptoms of post-concussion syndrome are anxiety and depression, but injury to that part of the brain also leads to emotional dysregulation, so like sudden anger and rage attacks. Would that be the fight or flight syndrome? Um, it, it's, it's a little more than that. It's, it's kind of like if you get a little, if you get a little bit angry or upset, you don't get angry or upset appropriate to the situation. You get angry and upset way over the top to what the situation dictates. So next slide is, is about brain MRI, DTI, neuroquant. Um, you've probably often heard, heard it said that you can't see a concussion injury or mostly you can't see a concussion injury or you can't see. or mostly you can't see a concussion injury or you can't see chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Well, the application of an MRI DTI neuroquant program seems to tell us different. Both of the veterans in the pictures you see in front of you were told that their MRIs were totally normal. There was no problem seen with a routine MRI. But when we do the DTI application, we see truncated fiber tracts. What are truncations? Well, that's where the, the fiber tract is cut off and doesn't doesn't continue to reach the periphery or to reach the skull line. It's truncated or cut off at that level because there's injury to the axon at that level. You've heard of diffuse axonal injury as being the hallmark of concussion. So what these, this MRI application is showing us is the diffuse axonal injury or the disconnectedness of these neurons, these fiber tracks, the kind of problems it gives you is it, it's kind of like a computer with a lot of glitches. A lot of things are, are happening more slowly than they should be. And a lot of things don't really connect up. So they, these lines should normally, or these flares should normally be reaching the ends of, or the cranium, correct? I mean, they're supposed to be- yeah. It essentially normal would be going from, you know, the, the corpus callosum in the middle, reaching out all the way to the skull, to the periphery. That would be normal and intact. This is called a right IQ functional vision test. And so what this looks at is your ability to coordinate your eye movements, to scan back and forth, scan up and down, visually fixate. This is a, a functional test that we use for, for all our concussion patients to get a baseline to see where they're at in terms of coordinating vision. So we also do a screening cognitive test that has a lot to do with reaction time. This is a baseline prior to getting hyperbaric treatments. And this will help us to, to make the call on how much healing has taken place when people repeat that cognitive test. Next, we have a video here with Dr. Bob Sexton, who is also at Dr. Hendricks's clinic. And Dr. Sexton uh, is a veteran himself and was an army field surgeon. Dr. Sexton is gonna explain the hyperbaric chamber, show it, the inside and out, and how it operates. Over in the nose and mouth, and they get oxygen 100%, and it gets up to a certain pressure. I'm going to explain that right now. These are some of the agents that we use. Uh, this is our compressor, air compressor, that we have to pipe in to increase the pressure of the of the chamber. This is our uh, this is our atmospheric pressure, and when we start down here at, at sea level outside where we are now, oxygen 100% really doesn't do much for you. Unless, you're, unless your oxygen is low and you need something in an emergency. Otherwise, you get in the chamber and we start to increase the pressure. When it gets about halfway up, maybe, maybe eight feet underwater, that's when the uh, oxygen is really beneficial. It just floods the tissues 
and gets in, especially in the areas of, of injury, like traumatic brain injury. Uh, when it gets all the way up to about here, about one and a half atmospheres, that's like 16 feet underwater. Right up between between the, these two marks there. And uh, and then we let them sit for about 50, 55 minutes. At the end of that time, then we start bringing the pressure down, and when we get it back down to this critical level here, where oxygen really is not beneficial anymore at any lower atmospheric pressure, we turn the oxygen off and we just pipe in regular room air for the remainder, maybe four or five minutes until they're out. While they're in there, we can communicate with this intercom. We can hear them, and then they can hear our answers in there. If there's an emergency, we have uh, the emergency uh, 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 beepers that we can uh, let the air escape quicker than usual. Um, thank goodness there haven't been any for, for uh, the time that I've been here, at least, for, for a long, long time. Um, let's see. Yeah, I've never had to emergently get anyone out of the chamber. And I've been doing this for 18 years. Well, my atmosphere, and uh, we open up the chamber, and the patients come out, and we put a new crew in that follows them. We do this about every hour. We start at uh, six or seven in the morning. We finish at, at about three in the afternoon. Hmm. What is it like as a veteran to go through a hyperbaric chamber? What is it, or as a, as a patient? Um, it's just like being in an airplane. You might have to work a little bit at equalizing the pressure in your ears, but that's what it's like being on an airplane. You just you just sit in there for an hour. There's a television that faces into the chamber. You can read, you can meditate, you can sleep. Next, we have a testimonial from a veteran named Clint. It's rather moving. Just sit back, relax, and and soak this in. Uh, my name is Clint Chamberlain, uh, formerly a sergeant in the United States military with the 75th Ranger Regiment and with the 2nd second Ranger Battalion for five years and six months of my career. I've, I think I've, got, I've been knocked unconscious maybe three times in my entire life. I was never diagnosed with a, a concussion. I was checked by the medic, of course, out there doing our training exercise. But if you picture your brain and your brain stem there's a flower, and you shake that thing, it's very fragile inside that skull. I don't care how much padding you put on it, it doesn't protect your brain. It just protects the skull, your carrier. It, it's an accumulative effect. So whether it's rattling your head one day and then you get a, a week off or another week off and you go out doing your job and you're knocking on doors, blowing them in. I mean, we all know that you get six feet standoff from some of those, those breaches and you know that's all you have to work with, but it's necessary. It's necessary to get that job done. It's necessary to have that violence of action and, and get in that room as safely as possible so you can do your job. You know, and they're suffering major life altering effects. For instance, you know, you, you can't put a plan together. You can't make your life come together no matter how hard you try. Your spouse is starting to notice the difference usually first because it bursts into a rage in an instant over something that normally would have never affected you, but all of a sudden you're ready to rip the walls off. These are all things I, I've lived with, man. Uh, it completely dismantled my life. Look at our suicide rates alone. It, it's just disgusting that this is, has been put off and blocked by the FDA and special interests out there trying to keep pharmaceuticals pumping through our vets, and, and, it's, and it's stealing them from their families. It's, it's stealing their life away from them, making them shadows of their former selves. And I speak from experience. My first experience at the VA was... was of course, after ATS from the military, um, I was having problems in my relationship and, and, and holding my life together. I, I, I couldn't even formulate a plan before I got out of the military. I, I couldn't pick a hole and stick to it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have a career path. I couldn't even think of about what my next goal was going to be or even have a dream of, of accomplishing anything greater. And I couldn't figure out why. I couldn't figure out why I hated myself so much, why, why I had such self-loathing and, and started to develop these very suicidal thoughts, even if everything could have been perfect as can be, and I would still just want to step in front of a bus, man. And especially guys that were in the spec ops community, I mean, we were basically the pinnacle of success in the U.S. military. I mean, we, we took it all the way. So why would we go from being the best at something to... Wanting to end our lives or, or not well, knowing so, so, what the next step is. You know, myself included, when we get out of the military, you, you think, you know, while I was in the military, I 
was successful at this, 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 and this. And I, I did this, this, and this. That's what I was capable of. And now we're out of the military and all of a sudden, what's left? I couldn't see the things that other people see in me and would comment on um, whether it was my ability to fix things or my ability to communicate with them. I didn't really see myself as any type of valued asset. And um, I started formulating a plan to take my own life. Through what I know and, and my, my abilities to craft and design things, I, I came up with a pretty awful plan. And I won't share that part of it because I don't want anybody else out there getting any stupid ideas because it's not worth it. And they are every person out there in that deep, dark hole right now is worth the effort to try and get them the help they need. And, and, uh, and it's hard for me to say that out loud, but I'm here to bear my soul, man. Uh, I'm not pulling any punches. I got nothing to hide and I don't care anymore. It's time to get this message out there and save some more lives. So an old ranger buddy of mine, so I just threw a message out there and I just, I plainly said, I love you, brother. And that was it. And next thing I know, I'm getting a flood of text messages and phone calls from all sorts of former coworkers and guys I, I haven't even met and stopped at my front door after driving four hours through a blizzard and uh, with a plane ticket for me to come down to uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I'm over here in Tucson, Arizona at North Star Hyperbaric and uh, Neurology, um, working with Dr. Carol uh, Henricks. She's a amazing person she's uh she's going to be a lifelong friend forever she uh definitely one of my best friends she along with a lot of other people out there saved my life they got me in that chamber as soon as they could and within 10 days i noticed a massive difference in my disposition and my ability to function and think and maintain a positive attitude really kind of unbelievable and surreal at this point because i'm 50 treatments into the hyperbarics and I feel like my old self again before any of those experiences, uh, like I said, more so than I have in a decade. That's it's up. just amazing. It, it, it took a lot of people to get me here and, and I have an overwhelming amount of gratitude and all I really want to do is say thank you. And I love all of you. And I just want to pay this forward to show my gratitude. An excellent testimonial by Clint and certainly his his story, his clinical history is very consistent with so many of the veterans that I've seen. Now we're going to hear from Dr. Timothy Marshall as to how hyperbaric can be an incredible support measure for stem cell treatment or with biologic procedures. Pharmacologist, nutritional biochemist here at North Star Neurology in Tucson, Arizona. I utilize nutrient optimization and detoxification protocols in conjunction with the hyperbaric oxygen therapy to maximize the treatment's benefits. So when a person's nutrient levels are optimized when done with hyperbaric oxygen, that increases stem cell mobilization from the bone marrow. And if an individual receives stem cell injections, the nutrient optimization and the hyperbaric oxygen will increase the integration of the stem cells into the injured tissues, which maximizes healing. We also utilize far infrared sauna for detoxification of heavy metals and organic toxins as well. This is what I'm so excited about is this, uh, this application of oxygen, um, you know, this oxygen therapy or increase in oxygenation of the body systemically uh, after a stem cell or orthobiologic procedure. We have started just putting those things together as far as any, anything that can stimulate the muscles or bring blood flow to the area. And this is such a magnificent way of doing that. Yes, it, it's actually very common for people who are going to have stem cell therapies to come to us and maybe do 20 treatments before and then 40 or more treatments after um, because the, the nutrient optimization and the hyperbaric helps to mobilize stem cells. Then when they go to harvest the stem cells, they have millions and millions more stem cells available to harvest. And we know there is research that shows that hyperbaric helps the stem cells to integrate into the injured tissue and promote the healing. How long is a hyperbaric session? One hour. Okay. And then how, how many days in between, or when you say a, a certain number of, 
um, you know, of appointments, then are they uh, twice a week or once a week or how does that usually work? Hyperbaric sense, hyperbaric treatments are daily. Um, some of our patients, especially military veterans, if they have had really severe injuries, sometimes we treat them twice in one day. So two one hour sessions in one day that are at least four hours apart. A lot of times they get some IV therapy and other treatments in between. Um, but yeah, it is a daily treatment. And what type of IV therapy is included as a support adjunct measure? Well, this is an individualized protocol. Um, there's a lot of IVs that are considered healing IVs. They have a lot of magnesium, some vitamin C, some other trace minerals and amino acids. Um, my team works to individualize them. So I can't tell you there's just one standard protocol. He's in Washington, DC. He's like an unofficial unpaid lobbyist for hyperbaric for military veterans. He was a Vietnam veteran pilot and he's, he's a huge advocate for veterans to get care. I can't thank you enough for, for joining us today. I'm, I'm overwhelmed and we receive information daily on these. Oh, I, I was just going to say, certainly it's individualized for people who need detoxification. There are cells in the brain that can help to heal the brain that are essentially stem cells that can become the kind of cells they need to become in the brain. But we know that mobilized stem cells can also go to the brain and help the brain to heal. This is just a picture of our far infrared sauna, not ours personally, but the kind of far infrared sauna that we have. Um, Dr. Tim Marshall will prescribe a certain amount of time in the sauna and a temperature depending on what someone's detoxing from. We have to be careful not to overly detox somebody in one day because everything that we are doing helps people to detox. So it's not something you would necessarily do every day. Okay. This is um, to introduce the technology of thermography and how important it is for people with a lot of toxic exposure in order to develop a hard tumor. As long as seven years before a hard tumor develops, you can see changes in the heat, the heat pattern in a part of the body that's toxic and inflamed. And if you continue to follow it with thermography, then it can be suspicious for a developing tumor and you can follow it up with other kind of testing so you can get early diagnosis and treatment. This is not just my ideas. Um, some of the healthcare companies like United Healthcare are paying for women to get serial thermograms to follow the possibility of metastatic disease or redevelopment of breast tumors, for example, um, because it doesn't give women any additional toxic exposure. So here on uh, the picture on the right, we see on, under the arm, it's quite red and down into the breast area. What yes. is that? What is that exactly that we're seeing there? Um, that, that is highly inflamed area and could represent early changes of breast cancer. I mean, of course, there is a differential diagnosis. If somebody had some kind of active skin infection, that could also cause that pattern. But in the absence, you know, you always have a differential diagnosis that could potentially be evolving toxic and infl inflammatory patterns that might eventually lead to cancer. This is my IV nurse, Carol Ann. Mm -hmm. And she's in her room and, and she is the one that compounds all the special IVs for all the veterans. Um, this is Dr. Dowdell. Dr. Dowdell performs the neurofeedback. She's also a crisis counselor and she used to work with the fire service and manage crisis scenes. So this okay. is it. This is such a, a, a thorough, thoroughly mapped out program with so many elements. I'm wondering, is this 
when you did go to, I may be digressing for a moment. Um, when you did go to the VA and speak with them in DC, uh, what was your experience like in reception? And are they contemplating implementing a program like this within the VA or letting them know, uh, you know, being one of the unique facilities that, that has developed a program like this, are you introducing it to them? And uh, is there an initiative uh, in action? It's just, it's so thorough. When I, when I was just in a room and I talked to a couple people who were administrators and they just listened and asked questions. They were polite and interested and thought it was a good plan, but they didn't give me any action plan. And then when I went back with a small group of people, um, the other practice, I went with a group that was a couple treated veterans from other hyperbaric centers and a couple hyperbaric experts. And they just, um, again, it was, um, they wanted to hear about our programs and what we were doing. I know that we are the only ones who really have a comprehensive care plan. Um, <clears throat> and I know that they really wanted to be able to implement what we are doing, but there was a lot of roadblocks to, to initiating this. What were some of the roadblocks that you experienced in doing so? Well, the truth is that the hyperbaric community, in other words, Dr. Paul Harch, Dr. Duncan, all the other um, practitioners have been to Congress, have been to top military and top VA officials more than 300 times, talking to them about the need for a comprehensive clinic and for healing therapies. And the VA's response in general is that they're handling everything just fine. They've got everything under control. And there's, there's a tremendous misunderstanding about the nature of concussions and what it takes to get a concussion. And the military is not doing MRI DTI testing. They're just doing routine MRIs. So they evaluate all these veterans and they say, oh, you weren't injured. Look, your, your routine MRI is normal. So you were not injured. And so they send them for psychological counseling rather than considering that they have a brain injury and toxicity condition at, that they need to be healed from. So I think it's a tremendous lack of understanding, but I see this roadblock even, even in civilian medicine, in traditional medicine, there's a tremendous misunderstanding about concussion injuries. Um, and certainly one thing that I was never trained in in medical school was about toxicity or toxicity testing. No one ever talked about that. So, so there's very little awareness about toxicity and what kind of pathology and illness can occur as a result. Hey, we're seeing the same thing in the pain field. It's very much parallel with you can have a joint issue degenerative over, degenerative over time, but if you go in and um, go to a, a, an orthopedist or you know, a sports medicine specialist for that without the understanding of how toxic exposure and literally having plastic in the system uh, and, uh, and chemicals in the system can, can only compound a degenerative issue within a, within a joint or within a knee or, or within the spine and have it look up as, as though it's calcification when it's actually um, literally pieces and a metallic of metals in, in, in these substances that the body has absorbed. And, uh, and it, it's very frustrating for so many of our veterans also with this, there's not the uh, comprehensive understanding of chronic pain as a centralized systemic autoimmune disease of the nervous system. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's such, it, it's so similar in so many ways where unless 
this presumption is allowed and this, this acknowledgement, number one, that toxic exposure is this uh, underlying beast in exacerbating so many of these other conditions and yet they're completely related and feeding off one another in order for them to be treated properly. It's very difficult to obtain any type of therapeutic healing within our, our veteran community uh, without uh, a more holistic approach being not necessarily all naturopathic, but it seems to be most of it is. And it's a field where I think we have all uh, been raised that Western medicine is, is where everything is at, but we're in a new age of science and its development where we're realizing that uh, there are, not only does it take a different uh, out of the box type of approach when we're looking at orthobiologics and naturopathic medicine, and, and, but also the combination of these. So it's hard enough to get just one accepted, but to understand how, how massively impactful they can be positively on the healing of these veterans when, when combined, you know, that's a whole other, it's a lot of effort to get people to listen to that. And so frustrating when you see the differences that it makes every single day right in front of your eye. Absolutely. I absolutely agree with you. You know, we're, we're, we're the ones that are pushing the boundaries forward, you know, with actually trying to heal people and actually trying to treat the source of their pain rather than just medicating them. And the hyperbaric also helps with autoimmune conditions. May I ask you, is complex regional pain syndrome, uh, CRPS and RSD, uh, being a systemic inflammatory neurological disease, is that, is that also a condition which can be assisted by hyperbaric? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm right now treating a patient who was walking across the street and hit by a car and the top of her foot, you know, dragged and was impacted and she's been diagnosed with complex regional pain syndrome and she's had about 20 some treatments and she's much better. Yeah, I mean, oxygen is what you need to, to drive all the healing responses in your body. It's always going to help. It's never going to hurt. And isn't it interesting that you're just helping to support the body heal itself naturally? You're just giving it a boost. Absolutely. So these are just some other websites to look at for people who are thinking about doing hyperbaric. The North Star HBOT is mine. Healing Arizona Veterans is the nonprofit I started. Treatnow.org is run by Dr. Rob Beckerly. We believe in all the other parts and you know, the the nutrients and the IVs and and many of our patients will do the pulsed electromagnetic field therapy afterwards. But the oxygen is the most powerful tool that we have. Well, I can't thank you enough for joining us today, Dr. Hendricks. Again, NorthstarHBOT.com, HealingArizonaVeterans.org, PatriotClinicMovement.org, Dr. Carol Hendricks with Healing Arizona Vets. Uh, we are so appreciative to you and your involvement with our program as well and helping to guide us and our team in regards to the cornerstone of brain wellness within our VeteransInPain.org movement and effort to provide and empower our veterans with information and access to orthobiologic and alternative solutions for veterans. Um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Michaela. I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you.